but Tech Philippe is through the roof. Vacheron Constantin is following. Collectors are hoovering up anything and everything that has any attachment to high quality classical watchmaking. Even the new, relatively speaking, guys, the FP Jeans, Roger Dubois, and so forth, are getting snapped up like there's no tomorrow. But here's a tip that's as fresh as a warm loaf of bread that's so far not been pounced upon by the collecting elite. Daniel Roth Looking to buy, sell or exchange a premium watch? Visit Watchfinder, the pre-owned watch specialist. A big thank you to every single person who watches and enjoys these videos. It really means a huge amount to us and to me personally. Your subscription would be hugely appreciated. It helps more than you can know. Thank you. The desirability of watches has never shifted quite so much as it has in the last few decades. Throughout history, periods of technological and socio-economic change have often been the drivers of timepiece evolution. The Great Depression, rending pocket watches too flashy and ornate, for example, giving us the Patek Philippe Calatrava, a watch that's defined classicism for almost a century. The decline of mechanical movements and the rise of wealth in the 70s and 80s, forcing the hand of watchmakers into bold designs, priced high as a mark of status. These two major turning points are spaced some 50 years apart. By comparison, the last 50 just can't seem to sit still. If the 70s was a rebirth for mechanical watches as a luxury possession rather than a practical one, and the 80s cranked that display of wealth up to 11, then the 90s reverted back almost on a dime to a period of refined classicism, where watches were small and their value defined by their pedigree. The noughties sparked yet another change with the advance of modernism into watchmaking, sprouting brands like Auverk and Richard Mille, as well as ever-increasing case sizes. And the tens drew the community's attention to the importance of the in-house movement, with a move back towards the past. The big difference is change, or rather, how much change is changing. A hundred years ago, you could be more or less expected to live the same life as your parents, and your children live more or less the same life as you. Now, technology is advancing so quickly that the world looks completely different from one generation to the next, and with that comes a rapidly shifting economy. For a nascent community like the watch collecting one, speaking relatively, of course, these external influences will be reflected rather prominently until it finds its feet. And finding its feet it is, because there's been enough history in watchmaking post quartz crisis for the real treasures to begin standing out. This is where the likes of early FP Jean start to increase in value, as collectors recognize and appreciate the expertise in this maturing community. Watches that were once within the realms of possibility are launched into the stratosphere, where they will likely stay. But this is a maturing community, not a mature one, not just yet, and that means there are still places to go. One of those places is Daniel Roth, a watchmaker for Breguet during the brand's post quartz crisis resurrection, as well as for Gégé Le Coult and Audemars Piguet, and one in a long line of watchmakers in his family. Roth honed his skills with the likes of tourbillons and perpetual calendars, and before long, he wanted to make a go of it under his own steam creating the eponymous brand in the late 80s. Like any true watchmaker, Roth pushed himself with the most difficult of complications, such as monopusher chronographs, retrograde time displays, perpetual calendars and tourbillons, all housed in his signature flat-sided circle case. The 10th anniversary Papillon became the platform for Roth's signature pieces, like the conceptual Papillon Voyager dual time zone watch. In the early 2000s, Roth's company was purchased by Bulgari, 
which you might think sounds like the end of what made it special, but quite the contrary. As Bulgari has demonstrated with its acquisition of the late master Gerald Genta's brand, its stewardship has allowed the brand to explore even more of its own identity. And that brings us to this, the Bulgari Daniel Roth Caliber 206, the watch collectors will very soon be starting to pay attention to. On initial inspection, this watch doesn't quite seem to cut the mustard when it comes to collector material. Daniel Roth, by comparison to some of the more famous independent creators, is pretty much unknown, even with the Bulgari connection. Bulgari's emphasis on jewellery hasn't really done much to make the Roth name any more famous. If anything, the sale to Bulgari has kept the name from really hitting its stride. And this is what presents such an interesting opportunity, because there aren't many watches that herald from an independent watchmaker with the credentials of Roth that can still be purchased for a reasonable sum. In gold, you can hope to acquire a caliber 206 like this one for a little over the price of a new Daytona. But instead of a mid-range volume sports watch, you get a handcrafted piece with a legacy in true horological mastery. It may say Bulgari most prominently on the dial, but the flat-sided circle, the unique three-sided second hand, the longest arm of which disappears into a slot in the rehout, and the contrasting separation of the top and bottom halves of the dial are all distinctly rough. Even the step-sided case with its hand-soldered lugs is everything anyone would expect of a late 80s, early 90s independent watchmaker, even though this watch is from the 2010s. And here's where the watch retains the most of its period correct features. Remember how I said that the fascination with in-house didn't arise until the last decade? Back when these long-term servants of the master watchmakers all decided there was a market to take their skills and go it alone, most chose to demonstrate their abilities by modifying and finishing existing calibers. Only the very best dared make their own. So here we have an ultra-thin Frederick Piguet movement first designed in the 1950s as a pocket watch caliber. Despite being modified for use in a wristwatch, it still retains the glorious bridge arrangement popular at the time, offering a view through to the train of wheels progressing through the caliber, as well as a period 21,600 VPH beat. The caliber's original use means it dominates the case back and makes for a wholly rewarding view particularly given the very traditional use of finishing. Graining, beveling and polishing are all present and all applied in the manner in which they would have been by the man himself when it all began. By hand. The cumulative experience is one that is every bit what a collector yearns for. A blend of personality and tradition that makes the watch neither bland nor outdated offering a recognizable milestone in the revitalization of a centuries-old tradition at its very turning point. It may say Bulgari on the dial, and Daniel Roth may be a name most haven't heard of, so make sure to snap one up before they do. Discover more exceptional watches at WatchFinder. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. If there are any watches you'd like to see featured, please let us know in the comments below.